good evening. I am Tirthankar Sen Gupta. I'll talk about uh, metabolic engineering. Mm. So to begin with some biological concepts. So this is a picture of DNA. Mm. You have a sugar phosphate backbone over here to which these bases, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine are attached. And uh, the, seek, the DNA, the hereditary information that is there in DNA is contained in the sequence of this basis. So A, T, C, and G, the sequence that is there, that contains the hereditary information. Now I'll go to some biological uh, molecules, uh, like for example, proteins. So proteins are basically polymers of amino acids. Then you have lipids, which, is, which are a quite diverse group of molecules that are there inside cell. And uh, for example, phosphoglyceride is a lipid, which is a chief constituent of uh, cell membranes. Then you have carbohydrates, which are basically aldehydes or ketones of containing at least two hydroxyl groups. So this is a picture of glucose. And then you can have polymers of that. So polysaccharides are basically uh, polymers of monosaccharides. So now we come to the concept of genome. So genome, by when we say genome, we mean that it is a sum total of all the hereditary information that is there in a cell. And a gene is like a unit of heredity. So now this is gene expression is the most important process that happens inside a cell. So what happens is that the information that is contained in the sequence of bases in the gene is used to synthesize a functional molecule, which is called a protein. Now one gene gives rise to one protein, another gene gives rise to another protein. And this process that happens is the, the most important process that happens inside a cell. Because genes by themselves, they do not do anything. It is the protein molecules which are the functional molecules. Now, enzymes are proteins that catalyze metabolic reactions. So uh, there is an active site to which the substrate binds, and then uh, there is a reaction, and then the reactants and the products are formed, and this, then they separate from the enzyme. So enzyme basically lowers the energy threshold that is there and provides alternative path for the metabolic reactions to happen. So metabolism is the sum total of all the chemical reactions that happen inside a cell and they're catalyzed by enzymes. Now this is a small schematic of a metabolic network which just means that this is a pictorial representation of the reactions that are happening inside a bacteria uh, and so A external is the substrate that the bacteria is taking from the environment. Then A, B, etc., etc., are the metabolites that are there internal to the cell. And these we'll call as intermediate metabolites. And then at the end of the pathways, you have the sinks, which is where the mass is finally landing in, whatever substrate molecules the cell is taking from the environment. So now we come to the concept of flux. And uh, flux is nothing but, so if I have this particular reaction, and if I say that the flux of the reaction is 10, that means that 10 moles of A are getting consumed, 20 moles of B is also getting consumed, and 20 moles of C is getting produced, and 10 moles of D are getting produced. So what we want to do is that uh, metabolic modeling, so metabolic modeling is a technique by which we find in vivo fluxes, which means that we want to find the values of these fluxes as they occur in a living cell. So there's a living cell in which there's metabolism going on and we want to find what the flux values are. So now I come to the overview and motivation. So um, metabolic engineering is a sub-discipline of systems biology. Now if you, for example, if you have a car in front of you and you don't know anything at all about how does the car function, then the easiest thing to do and perhaps the most natural thing to do is to dismantle the car and study the individual parts in isolation. So that is the reductionist view. And once you know that, then you'd be interested to know how do these individual parts interact with each other, which is the holistic view. So something very similar happened in biology also. So what happened is that, because biological systems are extremely complex, so what biologists do did is that they, you know, studied the different parts of a cell in isolation and a lot of information in biology was gained from the reductionist view. 
But there are some experimental advances that happened uh, about a decade or two back, which had, you know, you could uh, monitor the expression levels of, pro of proteins, you know, the, all the proteins that occur inside a cell. So those are like proteomic experiments where you have such data available of different molecules that are there inside a cell uh, at the genome scale. So because of that, the discipline of systems biology came about that now that we have this kind of data which is uh, telling about different kind of molecules at the cellular level, then we can write some mathematical models for that. So what I will talk about is this process of photosynthesis. So as we know that organic molecules are synthesized in this process, and this is a very simplistic uh, picture because what happens is that the carbon that the cell takes from the surroundings is used to make a whole array of different uh, molecules, different organic molecules. Now, suppose, so, as I, so a wild-type cell is a cell that you get in nature. So if there is a bacterial cell that is there in nature, that is called a wild-type cell. Now, a wild-type, so what we are interested in is the following, that suppose you have a wild-type cell which has a capacity to produce ethanol, which is a commercial metabolite. So you put the cell in the environment, it's going to do photosynthesis and synthesize ethanol from it. And if the cell synthesizes ethanol, you can use it for commercial purposes. Now, what we want is that we want to improve the productivity of the ethanol. So that will help us, obviously, in, I mean, the higher amount of ethanol it produces, the better it is for us. Now, the problem here is that there is a conflict of interest between what you want the cell to do and what the cell itself wants to do. Because the cell by itself is not interested to synthesize ethanol. The cell wants to produce biomass, that is proteins, lipids, carbohydrates, and all that. Uh, you want the cell to produce more amount of the, meth of the ethanol. So the only way to do that is to do some changes to the genome, that, by which I mean that you do certain mutations in the, in the DNA. So because the DNA is the thing that finally regulates all the processes that are happening in the cell. Now, although the gene by itself doesn't do anything, but is finally responsible for all the processes that are happening in the cell. So if you do a mutation, it is possible that you have a mutant which is, with superior properties, which overproduces ethanol, and then you're happy that, okay, the cell is producing a lot of ethanol. So metabolic engineering is a mathematical approach towards this problem. And what we want to do is now we want to determine these fluxes as they occur in the living cell. So suppose I have the fluxes for a wild type and I have the fluxes for a mutant, then I'm done. I mean, I can say that, okay, this mutant is going to be beneficial. I mean, this mutant is going to overproduce the metabolite that I'm interested in. So we, these mathematical techniques are called as metabolic network simulation techniques. They usually are uh, formulated uh, such that, you know, the laws of physicochemical principles are obeyed by them. And you have separate techniques for analyzing wild type and mutant organisms. So what I'll talk about here is about one technique that you use for analyzing the metabolism of uh, wild type organisms. So uh, flux balance analysis is such a technique and essentially it's nothing but a linear programming problem. So what now, so it's basically that, suppose I have this line, so we know that as we are going in this direction, the value of the line is increasing, the value of the intercept is increasing. Oops, so sorry. <laughs> I think I pressed the wrong button. So this is a schematic of a, so I have a set of linear constraints over here, and the green domain is the feasible domain, and the white domain is the infeasible domain. So here I have pointed out that if I have this line alpha x plus beta y equals to z, then I cannot go beyond this point, because I hit the infeasible domain. So, uh, so this is a schematic showing the entire picture, that I have this, objective function z alpha x plus beta y, which I want to maximize. And I can have either a single optimal point or I can have multiple optimal point, which happens when the objective function slope coincides with the slope of one of the constraints. So when I go to this metabolic network, what I'm essentially seeing is that uh, in FPA, biomass 
max, uh, production is maximized. So essentially, uh, all the molecules that are there in the source land up in the biomass constituents. So the production of biomass is maximized, and intermediate metabolites, they stay in steady state. So um, if we go to the formulation, because the intermediate metabolites stay in the steady state, you can write mass balances, and all of them add up to zero. So we can represent this in a matrix vector form, which is like this. So s dot nu equals to zero, where nu is the vector of fluxes over here. And then you can put special bounds on the fluxes of reactions, which are like if it's reversible, then it's bounded between negative to positive infinity. It can take any value on the real line. And if it is irreversible, then it proceeds only in the forward direction. So finally, we land up in this picture. So here, I have the FPA formulation. So this is like uh, you maximize the biomass flux subject to the mass balance constraints, which say the intermediate metabolites at steady state, and then bounds on the flux values. And this particular domain is the feasible domain, and this is your optimal solution. So, so this is again the same thing. So now the problem here is that all the time you don't get a unique solution. So sometimes, or rather most of the time, what you get is uh, multiple optima, which means that there are infinite solutions and you do not know which solution to pick from. So there are several algorithms which tell you that, okay, they use some additional arguments to uh, find one solution from these infinite set of solutions over here. The infinite solutions over here, so one geometric FBA is a technique which ha uses additional arguments to pick a unique solution. And so then I come to the results that we had got. So we did, we did the simulation on a cyanobacteria, which is a photosynthetic bacteria called Cynocystis uh, PCC6803. And this is the picture for a certain mutation that was done. It is all simulation. So we deleted uh, genes and we did uh, simulation. So this is the picture for one particular mutant. And what we have is that we can see over here that the first value is actually the uh, wild type flux value. So that tells us what is happening in the wild type. So we can see that in the wild type, there is no ethanol production at all because the first value is zero. When we do the simulations for this particular mutant, uh, using this technique called MoMA, which is a similar technique that analyzes the metabolism of mutants, then we get this non-zero value of the ethanol flux. So I have got a superior strain now, which um, uh, it's not really that you can use this for a commercial purpose because it needs to be validated experimentally that whether this thing really happens or not. Uh, we did it using another technique also called room and we got a very similar flux profile. Uh, so that is in summary and these are references. Thank you.